40-year-old Ruby Grappero had just had a normal C-section, giving birth to a beautiful baby girl. But when her medical team uh, uh, was wheeling her back to her recovery room, she fell unconscious. Her heart stopped beating. Dr. Jordan Nur, MD, her anesthesiologist, uh, immediately had her intubated so a machine could breathe for her. He called a code and uh, 12 doctors and nurses crowded into the room uh, for two hours giving her uh, critical life-saving cardiac support. Uh, they, uh, for 45 minutes, they gave her constant compressions on her chest to get her heart beating uh, again. Worst of all was when she had uh, bloodless uh, rhythms. The heart beat, but the blood wasn't pumping out to the body. After two hours, the doctor said there's no hope. So they called the family in to say goodbye. After the family went back out to the waiting room, they fell on their knees with a couple nurses with them and cried out, God, please give us another income, another outcome. Please bring her back. While well, the doctor stopped giving her CPR, and decided it was time to call time of death. Ruby had the world by the tail. She had now two beautiful daughters. Then everything came tumbling down. Her heart stopped beating. You've probably had something painful happen to you. Everybody has painful experiences. God gives you something wonderful and you're singing his praises and then he takes it away. Maybe you had a job that seemed perfect, then the company downsized, and you lost the job. You thought you were going to have the rest of your life. It could be your painful experience keeps you from committing your life to Christ. You just can't understand why he would allow that. Possibly everything is going great, then you get injured or sick, and you're sidelined. Pain can come by virtue of just growing older. One guy said, the pharmacist asked me my birth date again today. I think she's going to get me something. <laughs> Maybe your pain came when the doctor gave you a positive uh, on a test. And suddenly all your dreams of seeing your kids grow up and get married and Growing old with your spouse and dying when you're good and ready went out the window. When you realized you wouldn't be there to see your dreams fulfilled. Or your pain could come when you lost a mate or a child or a friend. And you wonder, why God? This happened to a woman in the Old Testament. We find her story in 2 Kings 4. If you'd like to follow along in the Bibles that we have uh, under the seats, it's on page 365. This is the third in a series of messages I'm calling, Have You Seen the Supernatural Power of God Lately? We're asking, how can we experience the supernatural power of God in our lives? For help, we're looking to the prophet Elisha, who did many miracles. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat, she said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a, a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. She was a wealthy woman who lived in Shunem, which is a little bit east of modern-day Haifa in northern Israel. She met the prophet Elisha, invited him over for dinner, and realized he was the man of God. So she said to her husband, why don't we make a room for him? Then he can stay whenever he's here. To thank her for her gracious hospitality, Elisha said, what can I do for you? Well, he learned that her husband was old and she did not have a son. And so Elisha prayed and he said, within one year you will hold a new baby boy in your arms. The child grew and one day he went out to his father who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. 
She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. She knew that Gehazi didn't have the faith that Elisha did. And so she just brushed right past him to go to Elisha. When she reached the man of God, that's Elisha, at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. Uh, Gehazi is the scoundrel in this story. He tries to push her away. She's just a bother. He has no compassion on her. You don't want to be like Gehazi. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She's in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? She said, why did you give me a son? A miracle baby in my old age, and, and I fell in love with him. He was the light of my life. Now he's gone. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. The mother knew that her son was dead, not just in a coma. She had no hope that Gehazi could do anything with Elisha's staff. So she said to Elisha, I will not leave unless you come with me. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. Sure enough, just like the woman predicted, Gehazi could do nothing. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha got up, he prayed some more, then he returned. Elisha turned away, walked back and forth in the room, then got on the bed and stretched him out, out upon him, himself upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite, and he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Elisha, with God's power, brought her son back to life. This is one of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament. What can we learn from this account? Like this woman, we all face painful things in our lives. Maybe you're not a believer, and it could be it's because of something painful that happened to you that you just can't bring yourself to believe there's really a God who cares about you. We have to learn how to respond when pain knocks on our door. Parents, you have to help your children to cope with painful things that happen in their lives. What can we learn from this account about experiencing God's supernatural power when pain knocks on our door? I find four things. First, if you want to see the supernatural power of God, you must make room for God. This may seem like an obvious point, so, so simple, why, why mention it? Out of the kindness of her heart, the Shunammite woman made a place, a room, for Elisha to stay. She realized he was a man of God, and she wanted to know God. So she made room for him in her house. If you want to experience God's supernatural power in your life, you start by making room for Him in your life. A lot of people don't see God's power in their lives. Some don't even believe in God. Not because God isn't there, not because God doesn't have any power, but because they never slow down enough to experience God. You have to take time to read the Bible. Maybe use our journals that give you something to, to think about and write. You say, I don't have time to do that. Are you kidding me? How much time do you spend a day on your cell phone or watching TV? And you're telling me you don't have time to spend 10 or 15 minutes a day with God? Please. 
You make time in your schedule to go to church. You don't want to miss a message God may have for you. You slow down to pray, to, to praise Him for the good things He does in your life and to tell Him about the needs you have in your life. Last week I suggested if you want to see more of God's supernatural power, you need to begin to pray about the little things in your life. I wonder how many of you prayed about a little thing this week. Just raise your hand. Good, lots of you. How many of you saw an answer to prayer where you feel like you asked and, and God answered your prayer? Raise your hand again. That's great. Second, if you want to see God's supernatural power, you must have faith in God. God shows his power to those who believe. He doesn't say, I'll show you and believe. He says, believe, then I'll show you. Jesus did very few miracles except when people put their faith in him. The Sunanite woman uh, um, sensed that Gehazi did not have the faith to help her, so she went straight to Elisha, and she uh, asked him uh, to, to help her. And he, he came, and he prayed for the boy, and he got on him mouth to mouth, face to face, hand to hand. It's not the method that matter, mattered. It's God who raised the boy. God's supernatural power was even more evident in Jesus' life. Elisha had to stretch himself on the boy uh, two times and to pray. Jesus, just a word, said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And he came back from the dead. If you want to see God's supernatural power in your life, you must believe that God loves you and is willing to help you and that he's able. You believe that he's willing and able Sometimes when pain knocks on your door, door, things don't make sense. It feels like God's not answering your prayer. He seems distant. I, I read uh, recently about uh, Chinese bamboo um, uh, trees. Uh, when you plant them, for the first year you don't see anything. You water it, you fertilize it. Second year, nothing. You're taking care of it, but nothing grows. Third year, same thing. You, you're fertilizing it, but nothing grows. Then the fourth year, maybe it grows a couple feet. Then the fifth year, in a period of about six weeks, it'll, it'll grow to maybe as high as 80 feet. How does it do that? Well, it turns out in the first four years, things were happening. It's developing a root system uh, a, a deep down. And that may be what's going on in your life. You're maybe experiencing some painful things, not seeing much happening in your life. Seems like God's not answering your prayer. Often God allows us to go through painful experiences and times when he doesn't seem to be doing anything so that we will grow and then we'll give him more glory. Third, ask for a miracle. The Sunnite woman was in torment over losing her miracle a baby boy given to her in her old age. And she, when he died, she went to Elisha asking for a miracle. It's always right to ask God for a miracle. Jesus says, keep, uh, ask, seek, and knock. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. When Ruby's family was out in the waiting room asking God for a miracle, please bring her back. The doctors were pulling out uh, the ventilation and, and calling the time of death when one of the nurses says, stop. Her heart has started beating. For the first time in two hours, her heart started beating on its own. If you want the medical explanation for what happened, Dr. Nurse said it was actually indescribable. It turned out to be amniotic fluid had leaked into the uterus and traveled to her heart, causing an amniotic fluid embolism. It causes an air block in the heart that keeps the blood from, from pumping out. So she would have pulseless rhythms, but no blood would pump out into her body. Dr. Nurse said usually when this happens, the patient dies. Or if they survive, they have severe brain damage. The doctors don't know what happened to her amniotic debris. They just figured it dissolved. I don't think it's insignificant that this 
the, the amniotic fluid disappeared just at the moment when the family was crying out to God for a miracle. Sometimes God shows his supernatural power. So not only did uh, Ruby live, but now she's in uh, perfect health. Uh, Damon, why don't you show this, uh, this photo? Uh, Dr. Merce says, now it's almost as if it never happened. He says, I'm not a highly religious person, but you just don't see this happen. The next morning, they removed the tube, uh, the breathing tube. Four days later, she walked out of the hospital with her little girl, Taylee. She didn't even have broken ribs from the compressions. Ruby said, I don't know why God chose me, but I know he gave me this life again for a reason. Sometimes God shows his supernatural power by granting our request for a miracle. But if we think God gives us everything we ask him, we're dealing with an illusion, which leads to my final observation. Trust God when he doesn't take away the pain. God healed Ruby. He restored the Shunanite woman's son. Their stories ended happily. You say, that's great, but why hasn't God healed me? Why didn't God spare fill in the blank? We can't read the mind of God and know why in some cases he chooses to answer somebody's prayer and in another he does not. Sometimes it isn't God's will to grant our request. I've prayed for a lot of people to be healed over my lifetime. I've seen people healed of cancer, heart disease, couple comes with infertility and then they're able to conceive. Over my lifetime, maybe I've seen a, f a few dozen miraculous healings, but I've also seen scores of people go away not healed. God in his wisdom has a better plan. We may not understand it. We just have to trust God that he knows what he's doing. Atheism has no answer to the problem of pain. Under this philosophy, their life is meaningless and pain has no purpose. Evil is a problem for the Christian faith as well. We struggle with why does God allow us to go through painful things? But at least we believe that pain has a purpose and that one day Christ will get rid of all evil. I believe that sometimes trusting God in the midst of pain takes more faith. Pain is one way that God tests us to, to see if we really trust him and believe in him. The real question is, will we trust God in the midst of painful times? The Old Testament book of Job deals with this whole issue. God gives Job a wonderful life. He's got a Great wife, wonderful kids, plentiful riches. Then one day, without warning, without explanation, God takes it all away. Turns out that Satan and God had a little discussion and Satan said, uh, you think Job uh, is devoted to you? Well, that's because you bless him. You take away the blessing and he'll, he'll kiss you goodbye in, in no time. And so God allows him to wreak havoc in Job's life. He takes away his livestock, his servants, his children, his health. The, the key question of the book comes when Satan asks, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, he, he's saying that Job is worshiping you, God, because it's in his self-interest. You give him everything he wants. Satan is charging God with being naive. He says, the truth is, you think Job loves you, but you turn off the faucet of blessing and you'll see his faucet of devotion dry up in minutes. So the question of the book is, can we trust God in the face of pain? Job's wife says, curse God and die. That had to be encouraging. That doesn't sound like Dale Carnegie to me. She gives voice to the thoughts that surely occurred to Job. 
But he continues to trust God. He says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? What kind of faith would that be? Then he falls to the ground and says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job doesn't turn away from God when he struggles. In Job 1.22 we read, In all this Job did not sin. Then after facing a second wave of suffering, we read, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. A qualification is added. He didn't sin in what he said. But in his heart, Job has begun to struggle. Satan was dead wrong about Job. The central question in Job is, can a human being hold on to God when it seems that God has taken everything away from him? One can. One did. Sitting on an ash heap, scraping boils off his skin with broken shards of pottery. Broken hearted. Job discovered what people in pain learn better than other people. That he was not forsaken. That God was with him. Everything God does to us or allows to happen to us, he allows for a purpose. Sarah, Sarah Edwards' husband, Jonathan Edwards, had been away from home for some weeks in 1758 to assume the presidency of Princeton University. On February 13th, he was inoculated for smallpox. But the cure became the killer. On March 22nd, he died of smallpox. He was 54 years old and left Sarah with 10 children. When Sarah heard of her husband's death, the first letter she wrote was to her daughter Esther. My dear very child, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had him so long, but my God lives. And he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband and your father has left us. We're all given to God, and there I am and love to be your affectionate mother, Sarah Edwards. Wow. Dead at the age of 54 due to an inoculation. It seems so senseless. But Sarah trusted God. We all face pain in our lives. Teenager. Single person, married person, senior citizen. We have to learn how to respond when pain knocks on our door. Sometimes when we cry out to God, He shows His supernatural power by granting us a miracle. Other times, He doesn't grant our request. He determines that that will bring Him greater glory. He leaves us in our pain, but he promises to be with us. When all is said and done, one of the greatest miracles of God is when we learn to trust God in the midst of pain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. A woman experienced great pain when the miracle boy in her life was suddenly, he suddenly died. Father, many of us have had painful experiences. Some are living with painful things going on right now. Probably most of us. And Father, we, we come today like the woman and we ask for a miracle. We ask for your healing power or your transformation, your solution to something we can't figure out. Maybe you'll grant that, but... Father, maybe you choose not to. You're going to leave us with our pain for long, a longer time. And so help us to learn to trust you. I want you to pray right now. What is it that you're going through that's the toughest deal in your life? I want you to ask God for a miracle right now. It's always right to ask God for a miracle. But also tell him that you want to trust him in the midst of the pain. You pray.
Lord God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you love us and you're always promised to be with us, even in the midst of pain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.